um, what I want to do is to encourage some reflection on today and also some thinking about the future. Um, and we do have a very eminent and impressive panel here with us today. So we've, we've already met uh, George and Kerry um, and Mark. And we're also, I'm delighted to, to welcome also Andrew, um, Professor Andrew Thompson, who is, um, as well as being a professor at the University of Exeter and um, also a member of the AHRC Council, is the new chair of a new strategic advisory group for the Connected Communities Program. So he'll be playing a really important role um, in the months and years to come. Um, just really to set the ball rolling, um, I've asked Mark and Kerry to say just a couple of words, their reflections on the day. And then what I want to do is to open up to the people in the room and let's see if we can get as interactive and just... Um, connected a community going as we possibly can um, over the next 45 minutes to an hour. So, Mark, over to you first. I love the feedback I've been picking up from people over the course of the afternoon. It has been a great pleasure and enthusiasm for today, partly because it involves so much creating and doing. Lots of people said to me, it was great because we got weaving. It was great because we felt we were contributing to the poem that was being written, or the poems that are being written, which we'll hear later on. And I think that sense of creation and creativity and innovation almost around what the program is trying to achieve at the individual project level but also um, at the larger program level about what are the new things we would like to see take place that the program could facilitate that we could enhance and that we could develop over the coming years i spoke this morning about the recent funding announcements we've made that take some projects that are starting this year way up until 2018 2019 George put me on the spot and said, how long is this going to go on for, Mark? And, and, and you know, we do need to think about what we want the legacy of the programme to be. The current projects would take us up to, as I say, 2018, 2019. That's really going to be a decade of funding for connected communities. That's a very long period um, to have a programme like this. It's different from other strategic programmes that the HRC has done and that cross-council working has developed over that period. Now, that's a good thing. It shows the sustainability, it shows the creativity, and it shows the evolving nature of the programme that you're all part of. But in order for me as a funder to recognise that, I need to be to responding to the things you would like to achieve with that programme. If by 2019, I know it's not going to happen, but if by 2019, Connected Communities looked exactly the same as it did in 2009, then it would have failed. The key thing is about how we develop different approaches, how we evolve the debate that you're all taking part in and how we support that, facilitate it, and sustain it in terms of the programme's legacy, but also what comes after the programme. How do you take these issues forward um, over the period beyond 2018, 2019? What that really brings into focus for me is wanting to find out from you what you would like connected communities to achieve, evolve into, develop, shape. What are the kinds of things that, from your point of view, are being done very effectively through the projects we're already funding, through the kinds of activities you've seen showcased today, which only represent, as I said this morning, a very small fraction of the overall funding that's gone into the programme so far. And what over the next five years would you like us to think about as the funders of the programme? Now, that can be you want specific calls around specific topics, but that could also mean you want more events like this, you want more showcasing the potential of what's going on in the projects. It could mean more networking. It could mean using the programme to facilitate much better opportunities for different kinds of partnerships and different kinds of participation to evolve. And amongst all of that, we really do have to think about the fact that Connected Communities as a programme is trying to tap into a research base, community base, users of research, and all the different groupings that are involved, all the different stakeholders involved in this programme. What are the different reflections and different needs that they might have over the next five years that may have been met um, partially over what we've already done, but actually they may feel are still not quite part of the kinds of discourses that are going on around connected communities at the moment. So really, from my point of view, this session is, is an ideal opportunity to tell George and Kerry what you want them to be thinking about in their theme leadership roles, um, but also to give Andrew and myself a very clear signal as funders as to where we should be targeting the resource, what kinds of things you'd like to achieve, um, and how we should take that forward over the next five years or so. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm not going to talk too long because actually 
I, I would second that. This is a, an opportunity for you to help tell us how you would like the programme to be shaped. So, but just some observations on today. Um, firstly, connected communities people seem like very good people. It's, uh, there's just great people in the place. There's a good buzz. There are some really good conversations going on. And it's lovely seeing people finding other people who've got shared interests and who also have the, the same difficulties. Um, so that's... That's a good thing. The second thing I wanted to say was, it feels to me, I, I, I went to the workshop that involved basket weaving. I was very proud. I made, I made a thing. Um, and it, it strikes me, I'm not sure what the thing is, but I, I was very happy. Um, but it strikes me that this is one of the challenges of this program. How do we weave together? How do we knit together all of the different strands of activity going on? It can be kind of overwhelming because there's so much going on. So there is a challenge to us to figure out how we knit that together. And I'd quite like to talk, I'd quite like your views on, on how we might do that. Um, the third observation today is just how much commitment and passion there is um, for doing research differently. Um, and it's going to be difficult and it's going to be challenging sometimes. And I think, so thinking about where we go with this in future, one of the things that it seems to me is quite important is to try to create some safe spaces to talk about what we find difficult as well as performing what we find do successfully. Um, how do we share our failures? How do we learn from those? How do we create some spaces to say kind of honestly, well, we tried this and it really, really didn't work. So I'm taking away from this a, 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 hope, a sense that we need, to, we need to find those spaces to talk safely and uh, confidently with each other. A second thing is, is there's a real sense for me of the power of technologies as tools to enable us to do this differently. And many of the projects that we've looked at really are showing how we can engage and connect people in a way that is, that is profoundly different from what was possible before, but also the way in which that connects with very, very old traditions. So there's something for me about how we marry old and new in the ways in which we're working. And that ties into the last point, really, which is how do we locate ourselves in history? We're not the first people to have tried to do this sort of work before, and in fact there are some very serious and important traditions that we can draw on um, around participatory arts, around community arts, around adult education, around informal learning. And so there's something about thinking about what are the traditions that we can draw on to help us do all of this. Um, but those are just some observations. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed to, to Mark and Kerry. Um, I'm going to symbolically come down here. And so first comment or thought, hand. It's always the first one. Yeah, there we go. There's one over there. Yes, please. And if you could say who you are, that's wonderful. Yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then we'll go there, I think. Um, uh, Graham Crow, and uh, I was reflecting on how we started off this morning with a reference to Raymond Williams. And so perhaps I'd like to ask the uh, thoughts of people about how they would hope to have a conversation with uh, Raymond Williams in 2019 about what's gone on in this program. And I mention him for two reasons in particular. One is that uh, he did make the observation that was made this morning about how hard community is to define, although he added to that that it was a term that he thought was never used negatively. Uh, and that's something where I've uh, often sort of felt a need to, to have some private conversation with Rowan Williams uh, yeah. about that. Uh, the other thing was that, that he ties in very much with these traditions that you're talking about, Kerry, about um, adult education and so on. So in, in your thoughts on how we would be looking forward to have things to say to Rowan Williams in 2019, uh, one about the concept and one about the, the traditions of which he was very much part. Thank you very much indeed for, for connecting us to that. Yes, please. I think there was a hand there. Is that right? And if you could say who you are, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, Sophia D'Souza from the Glass House Community Lay Design. Hello. Um, I was really delighted today to be able to dip into other projects. And I think one of the things that really struck me is how many of us are working on slightly different facets of similar questions mm -hmm. and how useful it would be for all of us to have a, a mapping exercise done which really shows the connections between the, the various projects, what are the, the commonalities and the links between the projects, but also the various partners. Because I know that there are a couple of projects that I have similar, uh, the same partners in, other projects, a whole different set of partners, and how do, we, how do the partners as well connect to the different projects? 
Thank you very much indeed, Sophia. Who'd like to? Yes, please. There's another hand over there. I think it's Kate. And then yes, you... I'd just like to thank Kerry actually for that fantastic comment that she made in the earlier plenary about the role of the university, and it's got me thinking, which is about something which I think I think it's important to put on the table, which is the way in which knowledge is created is being changed by connected communities, and it's I hope going to change the finance structures of the universities, but also the structures of research bids. So um, co-investigators being community partners is something that I think would be really, really good. So I suppose the question is, how can you respond to Kerry's very brilliant kind of comments this morning with practical ways forward that can help us be equitable with researching with communities in a co-constructed, co-produced space? Thank you very much indeed. We've got another co comment up here. If we could bring the mic there, and, but uh, go there first, if that's okay. So go there, and then this gentleman here. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello. Um, Kim Knott, Lancaster University. Uh, just a couple of things that I think uh, you could attend to. So one would be um, the issue about scaling up. So mm. clearly, you know, got masses and masses of, in some cases, quite small projects. Uh, that could be rolled out to other areas. Uh, a lot of ideas here that other, other researchers could pick up in other institutions and so on. So a scaling up issue. Uh, making resources available issue. So um, great example over there for uh, just um, by way of one on the, the whole issue about uh, ethics and community research that could be rolled out yeah. across a lot of institutions and so similarly you know there must be scores of interesting methods um, findings and approaches that could really be uh, made available to a much wider set of audiences but including academic uh, research or researcher audiences who also want to make could make use of those resources um, very quickly uh, the, the whole interna internationalisation question, because obviously p part of the beauty is the local localisation of this agenda, but also, uh, you know, how do we take it, how do we scale it up internationally? And then I suppose the a challenge for AHRC, which, which is that traditionally the research councils, of course, have focused very much on the quality measure. Yeah. It's all about excellence of research. And, you know, obviously here, part of what's going on is the democratisation of research. And so there's a, there's a potential uh, tension, nothing more perhaps than that. But I think that the, the, the academic community is still going to demand the quality measure is hit. And so I just put, point that out as a challenge. Thanks very much indeed. And let's go there. Okay. And then we'll come over here. Um, I'm Ula Laki, I'm from Cultural Corporation, which is an arts and education charity um, working on um, facilitating intercultural collaborations and connections um, through mainly music for the past 25 years. Um, and it's been fascinating um, being uh, walking around today and seeing all the different projects that um, people are doing. One of the things that occurred to me, and I was discussing with a couple of other people as well, is where the, the balance um, seems to be um, and whether there is a power dynamic even in how the projects are structured, um, which seems skewed more towards academia and the arts are used as a device um, to, to interrogate how we connect communities. Um, I notice as well that Arts Council um, are not um, present here and I wondered um, what conversations, if any, you are having yeah. or will be having or should be having with them for them to also take on board some of the... Well, academia has... Academia has um, has discovered the arts, um, has the Arts Council discovered academia, and how does that actually work um, to, to enhance the same objectives that you have? The second point um, has kind of been made by another speaker back there, but I think it's quite important that where you have so many projects in this program that are working in similar areas or thematic areas, it's quite important for the learning to be shared, and one of the ways in which it possibly could be done is to have thematic showcases 
spaces, um, or at least um, um, a way of connecting those communities of interest um, to share the best practice and to maybe even collaborate. There was one particular example that I came across today where there is two departments in a university working on different projects and you even know what that yeah. they were doing it. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yes, please, let's go, let's go there first. I'm Sue. Does this work? Yeah. yeah I'm Sue Cohen. I'm from the Single Parents Action Network. Okay. Uh, but I'm also on the team of Productive Margins team, which has got Connected Communities grant for the next five years. And it was really, really exciting project and really good to be here today because it's expecting the unexpected, really. It's those conversations that you have and those um, interactions. Um, which which will inspire us to do different things for the future. So thank you for that. What I would say um, to, to to the panel here, though, know, for the for the future, and in particular around the, the the group that I work with, for example, very disempowered. You know, what can the panel here foresee um, that the um, that, that that your bodies can help? The work that comes out of the connected communities, in our case, regulating uh, um, f for engagement, how can you broker um, connections with those more in power, those decision makers, those politicians, in terms of the presentations that could come from communities, giving them a voice and getting those who are more powerful to hear that voice. Uh, thank you. And, and just a, a little bit more of a sense of, of kind of challenge, the issues of power emerging here. I'd just, just be interested at this stage, other more critical, challenging thoughts emerging? Yes, please. Let's uh, take the microphone here. Just coming from behind, would be good. So, so let's just, at, at this stage of the afternoon, what, what are the issues which you still feel are, are unresolved, are challenging? There may be also opening the doors to some new perspectives. Yes, please. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed my first foray into the AHRC and, and, and very enthusiastic about our project that's been launched today. But what I'm not, and I've heard a lot of enthusiasm around connections and arts as a device to connect communities, but I don't hear a similar discourse about ambivalence to art yeah. or the conflict that arts might cause and might not connect but divide communities. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so let's just see if we can we can key into any more thoughts of the, along those lines. So, are there currently? Yes, please. Let's let's head over there. Hi, um, my name is Jody. I was helping um, with the Transition Research Network, and when we wrote up our bid proposal, we um, put in uh, two. Um, we wrote up a proposal for two primers. One was what researchers could do to help transitioners and how research could inform transition. And the other was for how transition could research, um, inform research culture. And as it turns out, we got funded for one of those, uh, a primer to, for activists, community activists, to understand research culture, and not this or the other way around, yeah. which is something that we feel very passionately about as well. So, you know, the, the, there's, there's this knowledge in communities that people have have gone outside of institutions to build um, networks because they they feel that there's there, there's things that aren't being done in institutional places and so um, I just like to um, point out that in, in this case we we feel you know, we could have made a primer that would have that could have informed research culture which would which I think is is, is, is a very you know, it's, it's a, there's a real need to engage with a lot of the environmental issues that transition has been pushing for so hard. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of an opportunity miss that we'd like to see happen in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so let's just pick up on one or two more thoughts and then I'm going to ask the panel to, to reflect on what's been emerging so far. So, yes please, let's go to the front here. Hi, I'm Suzanne Seymour from the University of Nottingham. Hi, Suzanne. And I guess I'd, I'd reiterate some of those comments which were made about, you know, the more negative aspects of community and more, more problematic issues that sort of working with ideas of community can, can raise, mm. uh, especially, you know, when you've got different groups who, who maybe don't interact with one another and haven't done historically. 
And I think maybe today there's been quite an emphasis on British community, but perhaps not so much on how British communities interact with other communities uh, across the world. And, mm. and that's something I'd like to see a bit more of. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, just one thought over there, and then I'm going to turn to the panel for a moment. Yes, please. Um, thanks. Karen Brookfield from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, I've really enjoyed today. I find it very inspiring to meet such a range of committed people doing such a range of things. But I think one of the challenges I would identify for all of us is one that was really ducked by the Minister this morning, which is how do you get the results of all of this into policy making? I very much doubt the answer is via chief scientists. We were talking about data, maybe, I don't know. But I think the challenges are there for us collectively. The, I was very struck by the screen of logos at the beginning that Mark put up with just that range of influential organisations to use that influence to reach the right parts of government, try and help them talk to each other, which doesn't always happen, and think about how we should do that collectively. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I noticed that everyone on the, on the panel is sitting there scribbling wildly and what I'm not going to ask is for you to go through every single point that's been made and, and answer them one by one um, because obviously there's, there's stuff to take away and reflect on. But George, I'd just like to, to turn to you first to, and just ask what's emerging for you there and, and how would you like to comment on that? Um, first of all, i talk a little bit about Raymond Williams uh, you know, from key words where he writes about the culture being one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. But it is about 35 years old, you know, and in terms of a theoretical text, it might have some resonance and significance still. But I just, I don't know, it's, it's always a bit woolly, isn't it, with Williams? I mean, I know he was this marvellous writer, and, um, um, uh, you know, he was a political thinker, he was a writer about media, about television, film, he was a, um, a novelist as well, all of those kinds of things, marvellous, and a bit of a theorist. But, you know, when the key word is, key phrase is structures of feeling, I don't know, I always felt uneasy with that, that it wasn't quite one thing or nor the other. It was something that was edging towards this structuralism and post-structuralism, and didn't really get get there, did, maybe didn't get it, I don't know. And um, I, I, I'm reluctant for him to be set up as the kind of founding figure, although I acknowledge his founding figure status within cultural studies, but not necessarily of connected communities, because I think there are, there are other theoretical positions and nuances which are more sophisticated, more compelling, more complex, more demanding, actually, of us as, 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 uh, as, uh, as, as thinkers. Um, so I'd make that point. That sounds a bit negative, you see. I've just criticised Raymond Williams. And um, uh, the second thing I'd say is about the, the relationship between the democratisation of research and then the standard research council agenda around quality of outputs, of research outputs. And really, you know, I was thinking about this on the train down here this morning. Is I've, I was thinking of a difficult question. I thought, will I ask it or not? And, yeah. and, um, and I, thought, I was thinking about... You know, is this a programme where the Research Council is effectively funding the very sort of research, right, which isn't yet and isn't accepted as, say, four or three star rated within a ref, right? So that the, the research outputs, the best research outputs that might be coming out of connected communities, just aren't really the sort of research outputs necessarily that would get that world-leading or internationally excellent status because we're trying to do something radically different. And if that is the case, that's quite a bold move from the Research Council. Um, you know, the Research Councils are set up in order to fund. Everything about it is the excellence of research, research outputs. And um, if in these instances, actually some of this is to do with different kinds of outputs, outputs which are concerned with public engagement, which are concerned with um, uh, social impact, possibly policy impact, and which are concerned with um, a wider readership, and um, a wider audience, then that may take us away from the sort of gold standard in REF terms, a research excellence framework, sorry, that's academic jargon, research excellence framework terms. And, um, and that's definitely, I think, something worth, worth exploring and thinking more about. Thank um, you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Andrew, what are your observations so far? A few, really, and I think, a, and then a question to, to throw back to the audience as right. well. Um, I think very strongly hearing about the importance of internationalising the programme. I think that's a challenge, actually, for all of the AHRC themes and programmes. There, there is a danger, I think, of becoming 
Anglo or Eurocentric with them, and it's probably a, uh, a danger that we face in microcosm actually thinking about how we mark the centenary of the First World War, for instance. Um, it's quite interesting, I think, that the British Museum of decided to strike out and do something very different and are going to have an exhibition on German perspectives of the First World War, for instance. But I, w I guess that the international conference that was mentioned earlier on today is a big opportunity to think about how you're going to drive international perspectives on, on the programme. So that was one thing. I think the point about public policy is highly pertinent, actually, and... Uh, it may encourage you that AHRC has actually formed an external advisory group to think about the humanities and the arts and public policy. And I think I'd have to, and I, so I'd, I'd very, very interesting to see what comes out of this program uh, in terms of public policy. We've actually just created this sort of week uh, a, a database of things that we're funding in public policy. It may encourage you to learn that lots and lots of examples around communities, we've used communities as a sort of tag, have, have come up. So that's encouraging, and I wonder how much that's actually already been driven by the programme. What I would say, though, is that by all means think about influence directly on government departments. But one of the ways in which we, I think, play very powerfully into a policy-making process as an arts and humanities community is through a whole range of what you might call public policy intermediaries that are involved in debating and arguing about policy, and I would suspect are very well represented in the participants and partners that you have on projects that you funded under this program. Um, I, to come back to the Raymond Williams point, uh, neither to have a, a pro or an anti remark, but I think it, it, you know, one of the things that hopefully the program will do is to get different disciplines within the arts and humanities and beyond the arts and humanities speaking to each other about how we problematize and conceptualize this absolutely core cool concept of, of community. And it would be interesting, I think, for George and Kerry to sort of track what new thinking is actually coming through there um, uh, as a result of this sort of program. And then uh, finally, just one question. It is a cross-council program. And it would be interesting to hear from the audience as to where, over the next several, several years of the programme, they think there are opportunities for the arts, humanities and the social sciences to engage with other disciplinary areas, particularly the sciences and perhaps particularly in the area of, of medicine. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. And I'm going to take that question, along with a couple of others, back out to the audience in just a moment. Um, Kerry, in slightly under a minute, um, what, what observation might you have at this stage and what you've heard? Um, well, I think there's an interesting question around shared voice um, and the power of bringing this group of people together to um, learn together, but also to speak to policy and others. So I think there's, there's some work to be done around, if you like, understanding the resources that we have in this network making those visible so that we can mobilise them because actually you can't do much with the resources you've got unless you know they're there. So there's probably something around. I think we could easily spend some of the digital capital fund actually on, uh, on some of that. She says looking at Mark. Um, I think there's some questions around, for me, we become a mature field when we are able to challenge each other and when we are able to talk about the complexities and the difficulties and the problems and the tensions in all of this. So I particularly value the comments on recognising community as not just this kind of warm, fluffy thing that is that, you know, it's actually about, and it comes back again to my, my point about constructing some safe spaces. You have to work quite hard to make a case for this sort of programme. Um, and that can risk shifting into a mode of just uncritical advocacy for this sort of work and actually what we need to do now is move to the next stage which is about saying so how do we think hard together about some of those difficulties so we need to construct some spaces where we can talk about the complexity of this sort of relationship um, the third point is yes practical mapping one of the things I would say is keep an eye on the website that George and I are developing plug for it www.connectedcommunities.com no connected hyphen communities.org.uk or just .org. Um, anyway, 
because what we are hoping to do is to, is, to, is to be a good way of you finding out the other things that are going on. So keep an eye on that. And one of the things I would say around international perspectives as well is, um, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago with um, a lot of people from South America who were looking um, to, they are doing some fantastic work on rethinking university, I mean really different approaches to what it, the role of the university in society and I think we can learn a lot as well as sharing with them the sorts of work that we're doing. Sorry that was more than a minute wasn't it? Only, only marginally. Um, Mark in less than a minute. <laughs> Any, anything to add? You and then we're going to pass of my minute there Kerry. Yes, um, I mean I would just like to pick up on this point that, that both Kerry and Georgia picked up on as well which is almost the question of risk involved in the programme. Because, I mean, we should be confident. Someone said to me earlier on that it was really good that today they felt confident about the role that the arts and humanities had, but also the role that connected communities had in bringing together a very diverse range of questions, interests, topics, but also a confidence about the risk involved in the kinds of project we're supporting. Um, George has just touched on that, Kerry's touched on it as well, and it kind of relates to Kim's point in some respects, which is you've got excellence, but then you've got the democratisation of research. Um, don't underestimate that the, the element of risk that we're prepared to explore in the projects that we fund in this programme. From, from my point of view, if, if we go through this programme and we're funding things that, to put it bluntly, could conventionally be funded under our existing programmes, so under other aspects of the HLC's funding portfolio, there wouldn't be a need for connected communities. And I think whatever we can do as we take the programme forward to encourage you to think about you know, challenging certain assumptions, the negative aspects of community. Don't feel you have to provide a positive spin on what you're going to do with the communities and your partners, that actually the negativity is a good thing. Um, but, the, but the kind of tensions and conflicts are really important to this debate, because if this is going to be a mature debate, it is going to be around those conflict points and those tension points. And what I would say in relation to, to that as well is that we're very conscious that some of the difficulties that people have picked up in different events we've done around connected communities have been to do with, if you like, we talk about we want to encourage risk, we want to encourage some innovation, we want to think about new ways of approaching this topic. Um, but we do get you to fill in quite conventional application forms, which are not necessarily there and designed to, to meet that sense in which you're able to put forward a really striking idea that's going to challenge assumptions, that's going to change the way people think about things. And it's certainly something that we are taking forward in discussions with Kerry and George about the whole application process for what goes on in connected communities as well. Should it be more responsive to the kind of ways in which partners um, and researchers working together need to fit in their narratives about what they're asking for, the projects they want to do? Is it that we're stymieing a certain degree of creativity um, in the conventional side of the application process itself. I can see quite a lot of nods to, to that point, and we, we do recognise that as an issue. Thank you very much indeed um, to, to all of you. I'd like just to take some further comments. We already have a hand. Um, particularly interested at this stage in thoughts for the future. Uh, we have Andrew's particular question about connecting with sciences, medicine, and so on. Um, so, next comment. Um, that, well, that wasn't particularly about connecting That's absolutely sciences. fine, whatever you wish. Yeah. Um, Sarah Banks, Durham University, involved in the Ethical Guidelines project. One thing that struck me, we've had a lot of talk about trying to change the culture of, of universities, which I think is where we need to go next. And the AHRC and ESRC and the Connected Commun Communities Programme has been part of that by allowing us to do the risky projects and by getting the energy and enthusiasm of people in this room. But what struck me when I've been doing the work with quite a lot of projects on looking at the ethical issues and challenges is a lot of the people in this room are people who are still the passionate, committed, slightly off-piste people. Are we mainstream? I mean, if we're doing risky work, then in a sense we don't want to be mainstream. Um, but it's only if we get into the mainstream and really challenge our universities. So I suppose my question really is to my colleagues in this room in the university sector as well as in the community partner sector is what can we do more together to really challenge our own universities rather than sort of going weaving round the research ethics committee and complaining or our procurement people who tell us we can't use our community partners to produce our films or our legal people who say our community partners can't work with us because they aren't qualified, etc. Yeah. Um, that takes a lot of energy to really chip away at that, and we're often just going under the radar and, and, and just filling in the forms and then doing something different. So what can we actually do 
collectively, um, and with the help, I think, of people like Carrie and, and George, to, to challenge each of our own institutions to, to open up a bit more. And one of the Very key good. challenges which came to me at my stand today was from a community partner, which is when is the AHRC and ESRC going to actually give the money to the community partners as the lead yeah. uh, in, in, in this process, uh, rather than to the universities, which is quite a risk and a challenge. Yeah, Thanks. thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Let's go there. Thank you. Um, Adam Thorpe from University of the Arts London. Hi there. Uh, hello. Uh, in response to some of the comments earlier about that I understood as being uh, looking at universities as sort of social or societal assets and looking at um, how we might scale any sort of positive activity in that area um, and rethinking the role of universities within society. Well, we're running a networking project with a bunch of partners um, which is around design for social innovation and sustainability um, in UK um, HE. And what we're looking at is ways that um, students can get involved and mobilised in this activity. Um, when we look to scale research, often within our academic institutions, we sort of take the research findings that we have and feed them into the courses. And in that way, we actually manage to scale the activity because all of a sudden mm -hmm. we have a load of mobilised students running around our communities, delivering um, hopefully some of the, the some of the sort of the methods and tools that we've developed through our collaborations sort of in other areas. Um, now. Along those lines, what we're also looking to do on the 21st of May in Northumbria is create a critical space, a space for critical friends, where HE can talk to HE about what is working and what isn't working in their institutions. What truly are your barriers? How come you can get away with doing that and I can't? Yeah. How does it fit with the broader agendas you're working to? What are you saying to the people that sort of allow you or disallow you to progress with these agendas? Um, are you using it as part of your ref impact argument? Is it fitting in with your widening participation arguments? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the, the levers, really, that we can use to start to try to uh, mainstream some of this activity, as our colleague was saying, within our, within our institutions and engage students in that activity? Um, so anybody that's got any answers to that, we'd, we'd love to hear from them at thesisuk.org. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So I'd just like to in, encourage in the, the last sort of 15 minutes or so some brief reflections on, so what are the potential aspirations now for connected communities? Where might you take this? We've articulated some of these challenges, we've articulated some of the, the barriers. Where would you like to see it going next? Let's, let's move things on. Yes, please. Gareth Williams from Cardiff University. Um, about the issue of the relationship between the people here and science. Mm. Um, I'm only recently starting to work with people in arts and humanities, but I've spent many years working with scientists, both clinicians and uh, epidemiologists. And um, what strikes me is that they are addressing many of the same concerns and have many of the same anxieties about how, can community, how communities can connect as people here do. But I would be very cautious about too early an engagement uh, with those people at an institutional level. What I like about the discussions we have here is the innovation and the radical quality of much of the discussion around method, which would be sat on very hard uh, if you attempted to engage too quickly with some of the people who I love and respect, uh, working in the field of epidemiology, for example. They wouldn't recognize a great deal of what people are talking about here as being anything to do with research or anything to do with method. So I think there are many of the same issues being addressed, but I'd be very careful about forming cosy partnerships too soon. Okay, so there's a pace issue there. Yes, please, let's, let's go here. Jessica Meyer, University of Leeds, um, and this is not the hat that I came with today, but with my other hat as a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow, just responding to that final point, um, that one way that universities are already engaging between the arts and sciences is the development of Centres for Medical Humanities, that must be a very good one at Leeds, um, and what tends to happen, I find, when you're working at the intersection between the arts and humanities and medicine in particular, is the first thing people tell you when you're looking for money is go to the Wellcome Trust, which I did. Um, and it, I'm wondering if there is scope, this is from a purely academic point of view, and I, I don't know how far this could be pushed into connecting with communities to work with the Wellcome Trust, which has a very strong emphasis on dissemination and working with the wider public um, in ways that 
mean there are more resources available and fewer overlaps in intentions. So, mm. a possibility. Thank you very much. Interesting. We've got we've got a, a bit of a challenge here. Any other thoughts about connecting with science and medicine at the right pace and so on? How how can that move forward? I'll just pass the mic back there. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, um, I've worked with uh, people from engineering and natural sciences for a very long time. Um, my experience in working in the environmental field is that they view social science and humanities as a, as a kind of vector for the delivery of news to a waiting public. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's really dramatically softened in the last six months, yeah. 18 months, and I notice a very different quality to the conversation whereby um, a capacity for uh, critical, um, critical thought, for cultural depth, uh, want of a better word, resonance is respected, and I think that this is a really interesting hinge point. Very, very interesting. So maybe it is a hinge point. Yes, please. Hi, Paul Crawford at the uh, University of Nottingham. I'd just like to pick up on the point about medicine and science briefly. Um, there's a, a missing opportunity in this country. Uh, people are focused on professional delivery across the land in, say, focus on medicine and, and professionals. The big health uh, service in this country is uh, the service users of healthcare helping each other and finding solutions together, and the massive unpaid workforce of informal carers across the land. Uh, this community, or very large community, rarely gets a look in. In, in medical humanities framing, which is more about pedagogy uh, historically. So I would say if you want confidence in reaching policy makers, uh, I would head for the future uh, with centralized services being greatly reduced into the future, self-care, self-help, and community-driven solutions are going to be where the action is. And I suggest that many of the people in this room will be part of that action. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, would you like to go to the back of the room, Sophia, again? And um, so interesting, a, a sense of there's an opportunity in actually connecting both the challenge around engaging with health issues but also policymakers. Sophia? Um, I just wanted to, to raise you. that question of brokerage with communities in the community and voluntary sector. And I think one of the terms that I've struggled with and we as an organization have struggled with in in this program is being called the community partner. Yeah. In effect we are a broker to a whole national network of community partners um, and I think that's something that the program could explore further. Where are um, the partnerships with organizations like ours who are not representing a, a small community of interest in a, a specific place but actually brokering that relationship which could take the learning and knowledge out to a, a wide spectrum of communities but also can harness um, all of that learning from a number of communities into the program. Thank you very much. So just two or three more thoughts now. Other ideas about the future? Is there something we've been missing during the day? Is there an issue that's, that's nagging away at the edge of your consciousness that you'd, you'd like to bring out into the room? Yes, please. I think one of the areas that um, could be developed, really, which seems to me a bit of a gap, um, is more sort of political, sociological um, analysis about arts and humanities and social change and critical engagement um, in terms of arts and humanities, the role of arts and humanities in relation to political life and democracy, you know, and whether that's always facilitating that or could be sort of creating an impression of change or um, uh, diverting, uh, you know, other kinds of collective political action and, you know, that, that kind of uh, sociological analysis really about from, from a sort of structural perspective. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, please, there's another hand at the back. Thanks. Hi, my name's Laura Sillers. I run Site Gallery in Sheffield and part of the Sheffield Project. Um, I did think one of the, just as some gentleman mentioned it earlier, there are lots of really interesting developments within the Arts Council at the minute. And one of those is um, a big nationwide project called Creative People and Places. And that's about looking at some of the dark spots 
difficult areas of yeah. um, the country where things maybe haven't developed as much as they could. And there's huge investment in that body of work. And it seems like there's a lot of different things that could really connect with that strategic development with the work that's going on here in this room. And that would be a real aspiration, I think, from the arts sector to see the um, higher education sector connect on a sort of strategic big picture level as well as on a grass, grassroots level and maybe some of that data that's gathered through these projects could connect with that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do we have a, yes please, Let's have a last thought from the front here. Thank you. Yeah, just, just a comment really. Um, the, it seems as though the, the two... Um, uh, words that I, I struck me is, has been uh, politics and democracy as though they're different things. And I, 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 no, I, I'm surprised at that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed for all of the comments. What I'd like to do now is just to invite the panel to give us some final thoughts, observations. Again, you don't need to answer every point that's been made, but how are you leaving this evening? And obviously ready for a drink, ready for the evening sessions, but how are you leaving, George? What, what, what are you taking away? I'm leaving energised and excited and uh, impressed and uh, feeling inventive and uh, ready for action. And, uh, and I hope some of you are coming to uh, Spitalfield City yeah. Farm, where there's, a, I'm not sure if it's a marquee or a yurt, but it's heated and there's food, uh, there's a fire outside, there are tours of the farm. Uh, there's a bar later apparently too so um, please come along there and we'll talk more about communities, gardens food, food production consumption and so on um, I'd just like to say one other thing oh, well a couple of other things then briefly um, there have been some really interesting examples of possible organisations to build collaborative or explore collaboration with uh, Welcome Trust, Arts Council uh, uh, excellent ideas and you know we have that existing model within the program in terms of the relationship with Heritage Lottery Fund so the, you know there are possibilities there I think that we should be looking at further and uh, those sound like strategic ones. My final point would be to say that um, uh, you know I talked this morning about the fact that one of the things that we've been achieving and trying to do is to create a community of like-minded scholars and, uh, you, and uh, you know we're conscious that community can be exclusive as well as inclusive i.e. if you've had funding then you're in the club you're in the team sort of thing and if you haven't you can't get in sort of you know and uh, I've had several conversations with people today who are pretty keen and uh, seem eminently qualified and uh, in order to, to, to benefit from the possibilities of this radical program that we're, uh, that we're all excited about. And so, you know, I'd, I'd seek to reassure you that we, we are aware of this and we're, we're keen to open the funding possibilities up rather than be, you know, seen to be closing them down or keeping them for a, um, an existing group. Thank you very much indeed, George. Kerry, how, how are you leaving today? Well, um, yes, Positive. All, all, I'm not going to repeat what, what George just said. Um, there's, there's one thing that I want to leave with, which is to leave you with, actually, which is, um, I mean, we're called leadership fellows, but one of the things that we know is that organisations work best and activities work best with models of distributed leadership. And a lot of the ideas that you have raised today, what I would like to say is feel free to act on these ideas. Feel free to take it forward. Feel free to raise it with us, maybe we can help, but also just do stuff. Feel, feel empowered, feel enabled to say, actually, I think we should connect together. One of the best examples of this is, I think Michelle a while ago said, there isn't an email list for all the Connected Communities researchers. I'm going to set one up. And she did, and it's the one that we're working with. So what I would really encourage you to do is to... Is to this programme works if you also say this is what we think we're going to do and what is needed and we're going to start making it happen and then we can be a force also to back you up in that. So can I just encourage you all to do that, please? Many thanks indeed, Kerry. Andrew, where are you? Um, well, this is the first time I've had a sort of an extensive exposure to research funded uh, under the programme and I do feel very encouraged and very energised. I'm, I'm struck that... You know, the tremendous diversity in 30 projects that are presented, and I think presented fantastically with the posters. It's, um, it's, it, 
um, in a really interesting and sort of accessible and engaging way. And I'm told that there are more than 200 projects that have been funded in the program that aren't here today. So a slight sort of uh, sense of sort of um, being daunted by how, as an advisory group, we're going to get a clear view of the, the whole thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've very much enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. And um, just just before handing over to Mark, I'm going to suggest that Mark, you have the last words before we, we move on. Can I just thank you very much indeed for your participation this afternoon? It's actually been a really buzzy and stimulating session. I, I really appreciate. Uh, the comments for everybody and indeed from the members of the panel but I think Mark it's probably right that you should have the last word. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean just just to pick up on those those final points again I mean this program works and survives because of the research that's taking place because of the activities that you're undertaking through the projects and that point I made at the very beginning about evolution of the program is fundamental to, to the program's continuation. I mean, we really do need to see the program evolve, develop. It does that through you. You're a very distinctive group of researchers from the HRC's point of view, as a community, bringing you together on such a regular basis. I mean, this, I think, is the, by the, probably about the 10th or 12th event for Connected Communities I've attended over the last few years. And that's, that's really about, you know, the point that George made. It's not a closed club. It's not a closed shop. We've got to constantly replenish the audiences and the participation that are taking place in there. But you need to go out there and do that with us, and particularly with George and Kerry as the Leadership Fellows. This programme, in terms of its advocacy for what it can achieve, is about the projects going out there and reaching beyond the communities they're working with to build up different narratives about what the programme's about, what it's achieving, to bring some of that collective weight to bear in terms of the difference uh, that the projects are making, but also the way in which they can lobby in those kind of intermediary ways um, that Andrew was touching on for public policy change, for the way in which we can contribute to those much larger debates. That really has to be taken forward with you, not on your behalf. We don't want to be in a position where the programme you know, has a single voice and speaks for you. It's for you to have those multiple voices, to keep badgering um, Kerry and George with emails, with suggestions, with comments, and follow them up after this event. You know, we don't want things to kind of sit um, and not be acted upon. Um, I just want to say one final thing, which is a thank you to all the HRC staff who've been involved in today. Some people stayed overnight and I think have been setting up stands and doing various things since about 7 o'clock this morning. HRC staff have been around um, for, for the entire day and they do have a very strong commitment to this programme. Most of you will be very familiar with them from various events. I'm not going to name them all. I'd like to thank the comms team for the work they've done on the event as well. And I would like to pay particular thanks to a person you will all know um, if you've been involved with the Connected Communities programme for the last few years, which is Gary Grubb, who's my associate director. But Gary very much takes a back seat in some of these events, but I think he does deserve full credit for actually an awful lot of what the project and the programme has achieved so far in terms of the different funding calls and in terms of taking the activities forward and being a real lobbying force within the research councils for what Connected Communities can do. So I'd like to end with a thank you to Gary and the rest of the HRC staff for today's event.